At long last, we're proud and humbled to bring you Pandora's Box. Stay tuned. The Pandora's Box and 3MOA, or PB3 for short, is our take on an enclosed emitter miniature red dot sight that's intended for use on handguns, subguns, uh, or even as a main or offset optic on a long gun. It's compatible with most acro mounts and you'll find that it's relatively affordable compared to the industry standards. So before we get started, I'll make just a necessary disclosure. The Pandora, similar to our other products, is not necessarily reinventing the wheel. We're simply just trying to tick as many boxes as possible. And as many of you know, our company ethos is continuous improvement, so expect to see some generational changes and design enhancements as time goes on. This is part of the reason why we offer a lifetime guarantee on all of our products so that you know as the end user and purchaser that if you trust us with your business, we'll never leave you hanging. Now, before we get into the details of this gal, let me lay the foundation real quick of the current optic space. To get started, a red dot is a very simple creature, right? Uh, we all know this, but a red dot traditionally fires light from an emitter at an angle to a pane of glass. That pane of glass reflects some of that light along uh, the optical axis and the shooter perceives the reticle as a result. An enclosed emitter, as the name suggests, is an optic that places the emitter in front of a protective ocular lens to keep the travel path of the emitter free from any external obstructions, including dirt, rain, snow, etc. In our opinion, the two gold standards for the enclosed emitter red dot sight are the Aimpoint Acro P2 and the Steiner MPS. Both of these optics are fantastic and the engineering teams that develop them are brilliant. Let's start with the Aimpoint. The P2 is the second generation in the Acro line and the biggest feature set, at least in our eyes, uh, that was added to the Acro was the addition of a CR2032 cell. This battery greatly increased runtime over uh, the Acro P1 and it's currently class leading in its battery life. However, the Acro P2 conserves the uh, generation one architecture of an erector tube design, okay, where this little tube sits inside of the housing, uh, and that tube is what houses the emitter itself. And so when you look through the Acro P2's housing, you'll find that there is a pretty substantial bevel, or bezel, excuse me, around uh, what you see through the window. And that's because you're looking through a tube that's sitting inside of a tube. The tube is what's being manipulated by the windage and elevation drums. And so when you move the tube by extension, you move the emitter. This is a simple, durable design, but it sacrifices window size in comparison to say the Steiner MPS. The MPS goes about an enclosed emitter design in a novel manner. Mainly, it takes a traditional red dot sight and flips it upside down. The emitter architecture being placed at the top of the housing now allows for windage and elevation dials to act directly on the emitter, thus negating the use of an erector and obviously maximizing your window size. Steiner is a great design. It's an excellent optic. Our biggest nitpick with it, frankly, is just the battery life. It uses a CR1632, and in comparison to the 2032, its runtime falls short. So looking at these two gold standards, we very much admire the emitter architecture of the Steiner MPS. And we also appreciate the added runtime in the Aimpoint Acro P2. To bring an optic that bridges both of these design elements requires a clean sheet design. Designing optics from the ground up, as many of you know, is atypical for this industry. Um, you know, there are many optics contractors out there that simply, you know, purchase a clean sheet design from a one-stop shop factory and just laser engrave uh, a logo on it. We are solicited by these one-stop shop factories constantly. Uh, what they'll do is effectively give you like a fast food menu of blank designs that look eerily similar to many of the you know designs currently on the market. Uh, and they'll just ask you for a logo and see if you want to put it on there and sell it as your own. I think the last one we received currently OEMs for like five other optics companies and they offered us like a, a Acro P2 clone for like 50 bucks, like dirt cheap. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what we're doing. We're a design firm first and foremost, and it may not look like it, but I actually employ more engineers than I do middle management, warehouse staff, etc. That's not to say that we're reinventing the wheel here. It just means that we can take some more design liberties in how we do things like our PCB construction, our circuitry, our feature sets, etc. Now, as I previously alluded to, the first thing we wanted to do with the Pandora was borrow the emitter architecture from the Germans. As a result, we have a window size that's about 30% larger than those traditional designs. This, of course, means that our windage and elevation dials are acting directly on the emitter situated at the top of the housing, which fires the LED to a now inverted pane of glass so that I can reflect the light, obviously, down the optical axis to the shooter's eyeball. And like our LP1, we're conserving our emitter and glass sourcing from Japan. Uh, and so the window size and sight picture should be exactly what you'd expect 
out of a lead and steel product. We also packaged a CR2032 on the side of the housing, similar to the Acro P2. Uh, these enclosed emitter red dots, you know, you can either put a battery on the side or on the top. There's really nowhere else uh, to put a cell on one of these things. And so we consciously selected the left side of the housing for two main reasons. By keeping the battery off the top of the housing, we didn't have to worry about sacrificing either our window height or adding so much material to the top of the housing that we're now impeding holster compatibility. And by placing the battery on the left side of the housing, we can also put our brightness control at the top. This makes it easy for left or right-handed shooters to access the controls. And by recessing the power controls at the top of the housing, we've lowered the probability of inadvertently playing with the brightness control, especially as you manipulate the slide. Why? Because of course your main points of contact by your palm are the corners, which are serrated, and the sides of the optic housing. And finally, as a little creature comfort to the battery, we added a bevel in the housing. Uh, that's mainly to you know, decrease the probability of the battery impacting the wing of your duty holster. Uh, that bevel will effectively push, or at least try to push a little bit of that wing away if you're not really inserting it at the perfect angle. Now, the third design enhancement to the Pandora is the addition of our proprietary gasket sealing plates. These are plates that physically sandwich the glass into the housing for added security. Anecdotally, we've seen competitor optics uh, lose objective and ocular lenses under recoil or impact uh, because the momentum uh, defeats the adhesive that keeps the glass secured into the housing. And look, when it comes to optics manufacturing, here's the thing about adhesive application. It's hard to do consistently. If you want to be perfect about it, you got to automate it. And to automate it requires a lot of money. So if you're purely relying on manual application of optical grade adhesive, you may encounter some of these more, you know, comical oddities. Now, our lenses are also affixed into the housing with UV cured optical grade adhesive, but those gasket plates that sandwich the lenses into the housing are effectively negating the shear forces that are acting on the adhesive junctures. For the most part, it keeps things in place. Our plates also provide adequate material offset against the ocular and objective lenses. And so if you're pulling your pistol through a barricade, let's say, or you're racking the slide of your handgun off of a barrier, you should be okay. Now, is the Pandora durable? Yes, it's durable. Is it indestructible? No, absolutely not. You know, finite element analysis was at the forefront of much of our design process, and we're very conscious in selecting 7,000 series aluminum to machine the housing from. Uh, but at the same time, you know, yeah, it can take a couple of tumbles, but don't expect ACOG levels of durability out of this thing. It's simply impossible. And on the durability note, the Pandora does not offer shake away technology. Okay, similar to the initial introduction of our LP1, we consciously avoided the use of accelerometers because they're usually a little touchy after impact. We don't want an optic that will fail to shake awake, if that makes sense. Uh, will it eventually be added when we eventually add or awake? Yes, but until then, the Pandora is constant on. And on that note, the Pandora offers 10 different brightness settings Okay, from you know your first couple night vision settings all the way up to like nuclear bright. Uh, we generally don't like offering blanket battery life statements. The average runtime for this thing, if you keep it within typical daylight settings, will be around 30,000 hours. But at the same time, it is totally dependent upon your personal battery life selection. If you crank that thing up to 10, don't expect it to last you more than a couple of months before it dies. So yeah, that's the general overview of the Pandora. Uh, it'll come to market at around 400 bucks. Uh, we'll be launching with the black unit. If you're watching this video, then the Pandora is live. Uh, FDE and OD Green will follow eventually. So stay tuned for those. At launch, we'll also have some common adapter plates uh, and other mounting options available for purchase made possible by our manufacturing partners. This includes Apex Tactical, Forward Controls Design, Dawson Precision, KE Arms, and Partisan Solutions. With all that being said, uh, the Pandora is here as a result of a community driven project. Uh, our pre-production testing team, as well as our pre-order purchasers made this possible with your guys' valuable feedback. So I cannot thank you guys enough. We genuinely would not be here without you. And on that note, it is feedback that has steered us away from some R&D pitfalls in the past and will continue to be the benefactor to help us improve our products and raise the bar. If you have a Pandora, you pick one up or you use one, uh, please do me a favor and try to find three things that you'd like to change about the Pandora and send us those suggestions to feedback at leadandsteel.com. So thank you for watching this presentation. If you're at all interested, please head over to our website to take a look at our product line. Uh, we have a couple of things coming. If you wanna see our development cycles, follow us on Reddit. Uh, we're adding to our small arms line, eventually an LCAN competitor. Uh, it's still an alpha phase development, but we'll be opening it up to the public for comments here soon. We're also adding to our small arms line. Uh, there's a, a rifle that's coming called the Jag, or just as good as a, an affordable alternative to the all-rounder carbine. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, we're adding two brand new product families to Lead and Steel. We'll be adding nylon and hopefully weapon lights. So thanks so much for watching, guys. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Look at how big he is now.